welcome in Senator Jason Barrett. Better late than never. Sorry, Jason, for the delay. That's okay. Good morning. Hey, uh, you know, I talked to Mr. Hornby yesterday, who is uh, going to be with us after the 930 break, and we we're talking about the SSAC bill for uh, oversight of the SSAC by the legislature coming up, and I know that's worked its way into the Senate. Have you had a chance to see that bill yet or vote on it? Has it already gone through? Uh do you have a bill number? I, 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 I don't. Right. Off the top of my head, I, I, I know it just it we, gives the legislature oversight of the SSAC. We have. There has been several. There have been several SSAC bills this year. Uh, I don't serve on the education committee, so right. I'm not sure if the one that he's speaking of uh, specifically uh, has made it to the floor yet. Uh, like I said, there's been been numerous SSAC bills this year. Well, I hope one of them passes. Be- so do I. Because I'm I'm tired of that group. I just I'm, I'm fed up with them. I've had enough of them. Uh, but uh, that's an, more more of that story for another day. Uh, let Let's talk about uh, a couple of things you folks have gotten done so far. Uh, first and foremost, I thought you had three uh, major huge uh, uh, challenges to you this year, and I didn't see personally that you could possibly attack all three of them in one 60-day session. That would be uh, some type of tax cut, the reorganization of DHHR, and uh, the third one being PEIA. Okay? But I have to say, we now know that the tax cut is signed. The reorganization of DHHR looks like a done deal, right? And and, and uh, what's, the, what's the ultimate scenario with PEIA coming out of this session? Well, we have, um, we have passed the PEIA bill uh, the, the House made uh, a couple of small changes, uh, one of them dealing with um, out-of-state um, uh, cost share. Uh, so that's coming back over to the Senate. Uh, I, I think that we would uh, certainly agree to that. We, we may, uh, now that I say that, we, we may have already agreed to that uh, earlier in the week. Uh, I can tell you it's, uh, everything is running together. Uh, but, but, yeah, PEIA is, is something that, um, we have known for a number of years that we need to tackle. Um, there's going to be some premium increases, uh, as we spoke before, but uh, it's absolutely necessary for the solvency of PEIA. Um, it, you know, there, if you have uh, extremely cheap insurance, but nobody, no health care provider will take it uh, and it doesn't cover anything, then, then it really doesn't do you any good. So, so we're making sure that it's solvent uh, and that it's still good insurance. Uh, obviously, you've heard from teachers and state employees who are unhappy that they'll have to pay more in premiums, Jason. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I don't want them to pay more in premiums. But uh, at the same time, um, a lot of the a lot of folks that are that are have reached out um, saying that, that to not raise the PIA premiums. Well, they haven't been raised in 12 years, and so. Do, do they assume or just think that the PEIA premiums are going to stay the same rate indefinitely? Or, you know, nobody can say when they think the premium should actually go up, those that are opposed to the premium increase. Um, the private sector has certainly seen uh, drastic uh, health care uh, uh, and insurance premiums go up uh, in the past 12 years. And, and to think that, um, that, that we can just continue to put hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into the PEIA reserve fund every year to circumvent a law that requires um, the, uh, the PEI ratio, PEIA ratio to be 80-20, where the employer pays uh, 80 and the employee pays 20. That's not going on now. Uh, right now it's about 83 to 17. Uh, what Senate Bill 268 does is get it back in line with that 80-20 match. Bill. Yeah. Uh, Jason, one of the uh one of the statements that's frequently made by the teachers that they have deferred pay raises because uh, to in order to have good insurance, i.e., PEIA. Uh, the last couple so years, uh, there have been pay raises to, uh, made to the teachers. Uh, how valid is their argument concerning the PEIA with the premiums uh, uh, versus the fact they've had recent pay raises? And I do not know the answer to it. I don't, and I'm just hoping you might. Well, I mean, that, that was something that's been said for, for years, and I think it was uh, extremely true that, um, you know, that, that state employees, not just teachers, but, but who are county employees, actually, but, but state employees that have 
Um, you know, we have said in the past, the state has said that, look, it's not the best pay, but it's, it's really good insurance and it's really cheap insurance. Uh, and, and I would say today, if you look at the cost of PEIA and the coverage that you get for PEIA and you, and you compare that um, to uh, insurance that is provided from a private sector employee or insurance that you can just buy in the open market, PIA is still a, a pretty good deal, and and I've had a few folks that, that are upset that the spousal uh, coverage to PIA is changing. Uh, currently, you can add uh, your, your spouse through the family plan, uh, and the, it, the, you know that there's the, the PIA will cover that. Uh, but now there's a change that if your spouse is offered coverage at, through their employer, that they have to take that. And if they don't take that and they want to remain on PEIA, they have to pay 100% or really it's, a, it's an additional $147 a month to cover the spouse if coverage is offered through the spouse's employer. And I've had a few folks reach out to me to complain about that, uh, but when they compare the insurance that's offered through their spouse's employer, it is still more expensive than adding the $147 to the PEA premium. So I think that uh, really sums up and, and outlines that um, PEA is still a, a pretty good deal for insurance when you compare it to other plans. Um, fair enough. I and I, I've heard uh, several uh, concerns from the teachers, but that was early in the game, and I uh, and before a lot of the details started been uh, known. I don't know what the reaction is today. I think probably the next two or three weeks after folks have a chance to look at the what's in the bill, we'll get a better sense of the uh, reception by the teachers and the state employees to uh, uh, suggestions made. But I think you I, I yield to you that something had to be done. Well, it, it did, and the pay raise again is twenty three hundred dollars across the board, um, and and the twenty three hundred dollar number was used uh, somewhat because uh, we looked at the PEI premium increases and uh, in, in those that are in tier ten, which is the most um, expensive PEI premium based on salary, uh, their increase uh, was uh, just under twenty three hundred dollars. So. For those folks that are that are making um, very large salaries in state government, um, this is a break even. Uh, but with the tax reduction, obviously they will uh, save money. But those, you know, you look at school service personnel, and you know their raises have always been uh, significantly lower than twenty three hundred dollars a year when we've done those quote unquote five percent pay raises. So, for folks that that are school service personnel or state employees that are on the uh, lower end of the of the salary. Uh, uh, chart that you know this the, the twenty three hundred dollars uh, more than offsets uh, a PEI premium increase. The only caveat and the only thing that I will say that 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 where the instance where that doesn't apply is is for the spousal coverage. Is that when you add that hundred forty seven dollars a month for spousal coverage, then that could um, you, know, you know obviously would 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 eat up. Um, you know, some of that raise. And it works out to about $1,800 a year. Jason, I want to ask you about Senate Bill 593, which I know you know well, and this is a bill that would require every state agency to develop a locality pay plan for state workers. Uh, this is going through the House again. I know they voted down something similar uh, recently. What's different about this bill that would have them consider it differently and maybe lead to a different result? Well, the bill that, that didn't pass the House that dealt with locality pay limited to five counties. Uh, there was a commission set up that would identify the five counties that um, would qualify for locality pay. It set up a fund, um, and, and I just think that you know the, the experience that I've had in the House over the past number of years that when you limit that um, to just a set number of counties, um, that's a recipe for failure, I believe, on that House floor. This approach is a little different in that it requires every state agent to, agency to develop a locality pay a locality pay plan um, more based around market rate. Uh, and I, that the, the bill passed out of House Finance very late last night. I was there to a answer questions from uh, finance members uh, in the House Finance Committee. Um, and some of them, you know, push back on market rate uh, because they wanted to talk about the cost of housing. Well, uh, some of them think that we should do a housing allowance, and they have this 
uh, in their mind that that's a better approach because they don't want to affect retirement. So right. on one hand, they're arguing that, okay, we need to do housing allowances because the cost of housing in the Eastern Panhandle is so high. Uh, and that way it doesn't affect your retirement. But then somehow when you retire and you need to afford housing, that the cost of housing isn't high anymore. So um, I think that they, I think some of them are just opposed to the idea, uh, and they come up with whatever feeble argument that they can they they can muster uh, to to be opposed to it. This bill talks more about market rate, um, and that was when I uh, took questions from from the members yesterday. What I focused on was this is about market rate. This is about um, state. Uh, agencies uh, in our area that cannot hire folks because the salaries are too low, because they can go to surrounding states, they can go in the private sector uh, and make significantly more money. So, uh, Jason, it sounds like, I'm reading the Amy Summers quote that it talks about the concerns about retirement, uh, and it also it sounds to me like that might be the way to get this through, though because it sounds also like there's still enough people around this state that aren't going to vote for locality pay, but might consider a housing allowance, which could accomplish the same thing, at least in the short term. Well, um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the bills over there, if they want to amend something in it that they can pass, uh, then I'd be open to that. But um, I think that they're just opposed to the idea. Uh, the other, the other bill mentioned specifically, um, you know, locality pay because of housing uh, and those type of things. So, you know, they all say that they support it for housing uh, allowances, but I don't ever see a bill passed from over there. So, I, I'm not sure. I think that's just a, an excuse um, to be against this bill. Uh, if, if the bill talked about housing allowances, they figured a reason to be against that, too. My, my colleague, Matt Miller, so I think it was Matt said recently, the logic behind we aren't voting for locality pay because all of our teachers are going to move to Berkeley County and then we'll have no teachers because they can make more money in Berkeley County. Uh, Matt's return to that, retort to that was, well, that logic makes no sense because if that was the case right now, teachers in Berkeley County would be moving to McDowell County to teach because their dollar would go a lot further with a cheaper house. And that's not happening, is it? No, and, and what I stress to them all the time down here is that our competition from Berkeley and Jefferson County are not the other 53 counties across the state. Our competition uh, is in our border states um, for teachers and for all state workers. It, it, you know, we talk about teachers a lot, but, but this really uh, impacts uh, all state agencies uh, and all state employees. So, um, and, and Delegate Howe from Mineral County mentioned yesterday uh, when I was answering questions about no one wanting to go to McDowell County, should we raise, why can't we raise the, the pay in McDowell County? Because people don't, he said people do not want to go to McDowell County. I don't think adding another $5,000 is going to make somebody from any other part of the state to move to McDowell County. Um, I just don't think that's realistic or anywhere in Southern West Virginia. I, I just don't think that if, if people don't want to go to that area, an additional $5,000 isn't going to make them go there. Uh, an additional $5,000 uh, for uh, specific jobs in state government in the Eastern Panhandle, where the people already are, uh, I, I think that, that that opens up the ability for people to, to work for those state agencies to take those jobs because the salary then would be more competitive than driving uh, out of state. And maybe five thousand isn't quite that number, but but you understand the mm -hmm. you understand my logic here. Sure, Bill. Yeah, uh, going back to five ninety three, uh, and I can appreciate the the reason for introducing five ninety three, getting the locality pay uh, approved by the legislature, the total legislators is is has been a tough climb all the way through. But are we not anticipating or perhaps setting up a stage where the one agency will incorporate or give locality pay, another agency will not give locality pay, and then a third agency somewhere in the middle? Would we not be presenting a problem back to the legislators to say, fix this discrepancy? No. Okay, uh, why? And I, and I say that because... What this bill does is make each of them develop a plan. Um, obviously, once they develop these plans, they'll come back to the legislature and ask for an increase to their budget. All state agencies that I've spoken with want flexibility to be able to do this. Uh, DHHR, all of them that, that struggle to, to uh, 
to get employees in the Eastern Panhandle want flexibility to pay a little bit more in the Eastern Panhandle. Some agencies have a tougher time than others, and I think that's why you don't have a one-size-fits-all uh, locality pay plan because um, the the ability uh, to hire employees in some agencies is easier or tougher than others. And so I, I think that's why you need the flexibility uh, to allow these agencies to do what best works uh, for them and their ability uh, to recruit employees and retain employees. So to follow that just step, step farther, so an agency develops a plan that will address the locality pay and is going to be increasing their uh, their appropriation. So they come back to the legislators and uh, you folks will, will there be a tendency to approve their, their budget request to accommodate the locality pay? I think so, but, but also the thing that, that often gets overlooked uh, is that when we do uh, the, the, the state budget and the budget for each agency, we fund uh, all of their FTEs, their full-time employees, and so let, let's 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 say that an agency has a hundred full-time employees. That, that they have a hundred positions, but they only have ninety of them filled. Well, when we do the budget, we pay for all hundred of them. Uh, so, you know, if, if they know that they're going to have these ten vacancies or likely to have multiple vacancies, they can use some of that money. Uh, then to be able to to give uh, some pay increases uh, in areas where they struggle to to recruit employees, so it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's not like this would necessarily be this huge um, in- increased appropriation to, to various agencies. A lot of state agencies uh, they have special revenue employees and they have general revenue employees. Uh, and, and I frequently ask in in finance committee how many of those how many vacancies do they have. And the state, they always tell you that they have very few vacancies in general revenue because that's the ones that, that the legislature funds. And they always have these vacancies in special revenue. And special revenue is money generated by the agency. And so when, the, when they generate money, they use that special revenue to pay for special revenue employees. But if they don't, if they have vacancies there, then they keep all the special revenue, the special revenue money uh, within their agency. Uh, Jason, yesterday, let's go to Pacific Agency, uh, uh, and that's uh, ch- uh, Child Protective Services. Uh, yesterday, Lane Dill uh, made the point that uh, that the West Virginia Child Protective Service, at least in the Eastern Panhandle, carrying a caseload uh, five times greater than what's uh, in, found in other states. The only way you can address that caseload is to add in, uh, additional staff. Is there is recognition in the legislators of the problem? And I think there is because I think Charlie Trump just referred to this earlier. Is there, uh, is there recognition of this discrepancy and is there going to be steps taken to try to reduce that, that caseload? Yeah, and, and one of the bills that Senator Trump uh, introduced this year and I co-sponsored with him that we've passed, uh, at least out of the Senate, is a bill that uh, looks at population and caseload for the allocation of these workers. Uh, so I think that's, that's an important step to make sure that we have uh, CPS workers uh, across the state that are in areas where they're needed. What's the status of that bill? Do you have any idea? Uh, we passed it out of the Senate. Um, if, uh, it, I'm sure it's in the House now. Um, so I, I, would, I don't know if they've taken it up yet or I don't know the status of it in the House yet. Senator Jason Barrett, our guest here as we wind down in our final second. I know you've got to get to a meeting, Jason. Anything else you want to get across? Uh, no, just that we're um, – uh, I think it's incredibly important to, for folks to know that we have passed the largest tax cut in state history. Uh, we have made a significant step uh, in protecting the solvency of PEIA, um, and uh, we are given a pay raise uh, to your state workers that is much needed and deserved. Um, so the last final days, we'll be wrapping up uh, the rest of the legislation uh, to get across the finish line by day 60. All right, look forward to seeing you here in studio when you get back, Jason. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Thanks Jason. Senator Jason Barrett via telephone.